we have with us Alex Rollinsberg, the maker of Hold Up. And we're going to take some questions from the audience in a moment. But before we do so, I'm going to ask you a little bit more about you. So, um, Alex, tell us about so what, what's been your journey into film? Uh, well, I moved to New York after college, and uh, the first job I was able to get was an internship on the movie Capote, uh, which you may recall with uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. The director of that movie is Bennett Miller, um, and he advised me to get into commercial directing, so I started as a PA and worked my way up. Eventually became a commercial director, um, fell out of love with that, really wanted to do narrative film, and started writing screenplays. Wrote some screenplays, um, and eventually started making short films, and this is my second really official short film that I've made. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your first. My first is a film called Ruth. It came out in uh, the tragic period of uh, 2019 into 20, so it was headed into festivals, and then all those festivals became canceled or virtual. Some of you may relate to that experience. Um, and that one is a story about um, my grandfather uh, suffered dementia. And so I wrote a story about um, a middle-aged woman struggling to keep her job while tending for her ailing mother. And uh, yeah, and so that one is actually available online if you want to see that. It's on, uh, it's on my website. Cool. We'll, yeah. uh, we'll find out your website and we'll post it on the interview yeah. link on, the, on YouTube. AlexRollinsberg.com. Uh, there you go. There you go. Um, so what's next? Uh, what's next is uh, possibly a feature, hopefully a feature. Um, I have a large feature uh, set in an iPhone factory that I wrote a few years ago called I, and I have a smaller kind of horror thriller uh, film that I'd like to make. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'd like you to imagine mm -hmm. that you're on a desert island mm -hmm. and you can only take with you five films. I mean, God knows how you're going to power the player for these, this, uh, on this desert island. But the five films that you would take with you are? Oh my God, five films? Um, boy, got to take some Mike Lee with me, I think. That's just amazing stuff. Um, maybe like an old classic, like Boogie Nights would be good to have along. Um, some comedy. Like, uh, I don't know, I just recently saw like The Wedding Singer recently, this Adam Sandler movie. <laughs> Love that movie, can't get enough. Um, boy, I don't know, that's three. Can we do three? <laughs> What's, what are two more? Come on, what uh, are two more? Let's see, um, boy, five. Um, well, I, for this film, I really love like Ruben Ostlin's films, and so like something by him would be great. I love the way that he explores like uncomfortable truths and does the, does so through unexpected angles. So maybe I would take like force majeure or something like that. Okay. And then maybe ugh, we don't have a classic yet. So let's see. Um, boy, like Treasure of the Sierra Madre would be good to have probably. Okay. There you go. Good we choices. We made, well done. We made it to five. You got your five. Yeah. You got your five. You. Those are the five films you're going to be watching for the rest of your life. Oh no. Um, <laughs> so. Um, just, uh, you know, obviously you've spent a few day with, days with us, you watched a few films from all over the world, and I'm sure even when you're home in New York, um, you watch lots of films from all over the world. How do you think British cinema compares to American cinema? And um, what do you think... Um, is there like a common trait? Because I, I, I've, I've, I've had this sort of discussion with someone before. And I, is there like a common trait that you think would potentially put Americans off of watching when it comes to British cinema? Uh, good question. Um, I think there's British cinema that really relates to an American palette, and there's British cinema that's more. I, for lack of a better word, European. Mm -hmm. um, I trend toward the European side, and I love, in particular, British comedy and British television. 
shows like Peep Show are really important to me. Yep. Um, and uh, what else? Like Black Mirror, you know, obviously. Like those are just like wonderful shows that have really played a huge role in who I've like becoming who I am um, and my sensibility. Uh, Mike Lee, who I mentioned before, is another huge influence of mine. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that, uh, I don't know how to generalize though, you know, because there's, there's really broad British stuff as well that I think Americans would love. I don't know. If, I don't, I don't know. I just think, uh, yeah, maybe like the more subtle stuff would put them off perhaps. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so let's move to the actual film we've just watched. Do we have any questions out there in our audience? Where did hold up come from? Is this something you've read about or heard about or something you've experienced? Where did this story come from? A lot of uh, New Yorkers have experiences like this and I suspect Londoners as well. Um, this is based partly on a true story, uh, it's something that happened to me when I was coming home late one night in the middle of the pandemic and hadn't seen anyone but my wife pretty much for months and months. And New York, much like London, had become kind of like a ghost town at that time. I was approached by a gentleman from Eritrea trying to sell me lotion and a lot of the dialogue from the film is a direct lift from that interaction. Um, and it really brought out a lot of things that I was struggling with at the time. Um, seeing a lot, stepping out of my door every day in, in the East Village, you just run straight into suffering on the street. And uh, the polite kind of, uh, you know, neoliberal reaction to that is to ignore it and to walk past it. And that really bothered me and it still bothers me. And uh, this particular interaction really stuck with me and inspired me to make this film. Any other questions, Albert? I had one actually, just before anyone else. Um, the end credits really reminded me of another film. Uh, but I'm not going to say what one it was. Was there any films that um, the end credits were influenced by? It is, I mean, the typeface in particular. Not the typeface. The yellow and the typeface, yeah. Uh, not in particular, no, okay. I don't think so. Okay. It reminded me of Taxi Driver a lot, right? The end oh, yeah, okay. Which like obviously that. makes I, sense with the New York uh, connection. Could be, yeah. I, I like that color scheme, the yellow and on black. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for this wonderful film. I'm uh, curious about the way you wor work with your uh, actors and how far um, do you rehearse with them uh, up front or in how far do you, uh, uh, what happens on the set uh, and how do you feel about it? Sure. Um, I love these actors. Um, one of them is uh, an actor named Philip Ettinger who's um, famous for the Paul Schrader, speaking of Taxi Driver, he's the director of uh, First Reformed, which is a film with Ethan Hawke, which is a fabulous film from a few years ago. Uh, Philip was in that film, and that's one way I saw him. And then he's most recently played Mark Ruffalo's uh, identical twin, younger version of Mark Ruffalo in HBO's I Know This Much Is True, an incredible show if you haven't seen it. Uh, Renrick Palmer, who uh, plays Hashim, I found him through casting. Open, open call, and it's one of the most thrilling discoveries I think I've ever made. I work with actors quite a lot. I uh, work at NYU as a teacher, so I'm around actors a lot, and just just the way, I, seeing his tape come in, I just knew instantaneously that this was the guy. And uh, meeting with him, it's just only, he's only just like skyrocketed since this film, and it was his first time on film, actually. He has since gone on. He's currently in this like off-Broadway show that's getting rave reviews. It's just incredible. Um, but in, to answer your question, uh, it was requested, and I was sort of into this idea of like doing no rehearsal for this because they wouldn't have met before, so there was really no point in not uh, in spoiling that spontaneity, and that was a lot of fun. There was a lot of planning in the film, but that was one area that we kind of left spontaneous and unplanned deliberately. Cool. Yeah. It's so working, so yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Right, well, 
Uh, we're going to have to wrap there. Okay. But thank you very much for being with us. I just want to give a shout out to Victor, who's the producer of the film, who's here also from New York uh, in the audience. He came all the way Hello, over Victor. Here. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hello, Victor. Hello, Victor. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Alex. Thank it's you. Uh, been great having you with us. And thank you for uh, showing the film. Thank it's been you. wonderful to be here.